All right, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Tracy Deliberty. I'm with the Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences. So this is the 2021 Ocean Currents Lecture Series. Um, this is our first one of the summer. So it's our kickoff of the summer lecture series. It's the first of 11. I wanted to just recognize that um, our College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment and the Delaware um, Sea Grant is sponsoring this. Also let you know that we're being recorded. And in terms of kind of the question and answer, um, there is no kind of, of, of raise your hand. It's all in terms of entering your questions um, through the Q&A box. And then we will get to those questions at the very end. So I get to start off um, in terms of introducing our speaker tonight. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Daniel Leathers, who's a colleague of mine and also has been a mentor for many years in the Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences. Dan and I have offices next to each other, which is kind of fun because we can shout to each other when we are in, in Pearson <laughs> Hall in terms of having an attaching um, office wall. Um, Dan started his education at Lycoming um, College in Pennsylvania, where he earned a bachelor's in physics and astronomy. He went on then to Penn State to earn his master's and PhD. He started his academic career, not here at UD, but the University of Nebraska-Lincoln um, in geography as assistant professor for three years. And then UD captured him in 1991. He now holds the rank of full professor in our Department of Geography. He has served many roles in terms of administrative roles at the University of Delaware. He's been chair for a full term plus a year. He also has been deputy dean of our College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment for two years. He has actually served as the state climatologist at Delaware since 2011. Very important to note, and Dan's going to talk about this tonight in terms of the Delaware Environmental Observing System. He's a co-founder of that. Um, uh, observational network that has over 60 um, platforms to look at all kinds of things across um, Delmarva. And one last duty he, he has in his spare time is actually directs the Center for Environmental Monitoring Analysis. So outside of, of UD, he's been selfless in terms of his service. Um, he's been president for the American Association of State Climatologists, served in that a couple years ago. And he was also very much honored just three years ago by the American Associ Association of Geographers Climate Specialty Group Lifetime Achievement Award, our highest award that, that we give out. Um, Dan's research interests are in the role of snow cover in our climate system, the influence of land surface changes on our regional climate and also environmental monitoring. Um, he has a stealthy research um, publication and it's really neat in terms of looking at the last number of years where his students are co-author or I should say first author in many cases. He has publications most recently in physical geography looking at snow ablation event, International Journal of Climatology comparing extreme precip frequency and magnitude events across Delaware and also a recent publication in climate research looking at the synoptic climatology of tornadoes in the Northeast. Um, interesting to think about that in terms of what the weather is around us. Um, Dan's been awarded lots of grants totaling um, nearly $8 million. His most recent one that's been very busy on is a National Science Foundation one where he's a co-PI, co-investigator, and it's looking at water security in a changing coastal environment. On a personal side, Dan's married, he has two adult twin daughters, one grandson, which every once in a while being on Zoom, I get to see that grandson. <laughs> and I just understand there's one on the way. He's also an avid cyclist. He loves to talk um, with students about the forecast. And also it's fun to kind of see him and students talk about, talk smack in terms of rival sports teams. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dan to give us a talk on the climate change in Delaware and across the world. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Tracy. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, if you could just let me know for sure that you can see everything. Are we looks good? You good to go? And okay. it's in show mode. Okay, great. So, well, I just want to thank everybody for the chance to uh, speak tonight. I appreciate the invitation. And as people know me, I've been here, it'll be almost, uh, well, it will be 30 years this August, I've been at the University of Delaware. And I've served as state climatologist much of that time, and I really enjoy going places and uh, talking about the weather and climate of Delaware. And speaking of that, uh, I just had to show you this to start off. This is actually the radar from about 15 or 20 minutes ago. 
Uh, I live actually in southwest Chester County, Pennsylvania, where all this heavy precipitation and convection is going through right now. And uh, if you hear a lot of loud banging and a lot of noise, that's because we're having a thunderstorm right now. There was just some good lightning and thunder. Uh, so anyways, I thought it was just kind of appropriate that we had this type of weather on a night where we're going to be talking about uh, the weather and climate, especially here in Delaware. So I want to get started so that everybody has plenty of time to ask questions and uh, uh, you know, we can talk a little bit at the end. So I thought I'd start out with just giving you a little bit of an idea of the topics that I hope to cover tonight in this presentation. And I want to start out with really a brief primer on the topic of global warming. And I think probably most of this audience already knows, you know, how the, the process of global warming works and why the planet is getting warmer right now, but I wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page, so to speak. So I'm going to start out with just a little bit of a discussion on global warming in general. <laughs> Excuse me. After that, we're really going to go from the global scale all the way down here to Delaware. And so the next topic after kind of covering global warming is I wanna talk a little bit about global temperature and precipitation changes. Now we won't spend a long, long time on that, but I at least wanna give you a feel for what's been happening globally over the last century or so. Then we're gonna come down in scale to the United States and take a look just very briefly at the temperature and precipitation changes that we've been seeing in the United States, uh, again, during the last 120 years. And uh, that's, you know, hopefully will be interesting. But what I want to talk about most tonight is to really narrow into Delaware now. So you can see we're going from the globe to the United States to here in Delaware. And just talk to you a little bit about the climate here in Delaware and the and climate change that's taken place. And then finally, this is something I get asked all the time when I do presentations like this, is what does the future look like? So what does the future look like as far as climate change goes here where we live in Delaware? What are some of the big things that we may or may not have to worry about? So with that kind of all in mind, and wow, just heard a really big thunderclap. Uh, I love it. I don't know about the rest of you, but, but I love it. Uh, I want to start out with this very brief primer on global warming. And again, I'm not going to go into great detail. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody is kind of on board so that as I talk about things later, everybody's okay with that. And anytime you talk about global warming, you really have to start with atmospheric composition. And I always love to ask questions of people. And uh, I just talked to an eighth grade class about a week and a half ago. And I asked this eighth grade, eighth grade class, I said, so what, what are you breathing right now? And I got two answers. And you can kind of probably guess what those two answers were. One of them was air. And I said, okay, well, you know, that's fair enough. But uh, what is air? And the second thing that everybody said was oxygen. Okay, and that's what I bet if you went out and talked to people on the street and just asked people, uh, I've actually done this once or twice, that, you know, what is the, what, what, what is the atmosphere made of? Most people just think of oxygen. But as you can see here, it's much more than that. We have an atmosphere that's made up of a mixture of gases. And what I told the eighth grade class is, is they're, they're breathing in and out much more nitrogen than they are oxygen. And you can see here that our atmosphere, and this is the dry atmosphere, is made up of about 78% nitrogen and about 21% oxygen. Now, if you add those two together, you get 99% already, okay, of, of uh, our atmospheric composition of a dry atmosphere. The other thing that you're breathing in right now as you're listening to me is argon, which makes up about another 1%. So with those three gases, nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, you have about 99.9% .9 of the atmosphere, the dry atmosphere. And I'll get to why I keep saying the dry atmosphere here in a minute. And then there are some other gases, but the two that I really want to talk about tonight, one that's going to be the most important to us is carbon dioxide. And you take a look at this and you say, why is carbon dioxide so important to us? It makes up only about 0.041% of the atmosphere uh, by volume. And so a lot of people always you know, question why is that so important? The other gas that I just wanna draw your attention to over here in the lower left 
is water vapor. I've been saying that this is the atmospheric composition of the dry atmosphere. Well, keep in mind that our uh, atmosphere can also have water vapor zero to about 4% by volume of water vapor. And it's these two gases that are really going to be important to us uh, as we go through this really brief primer on global warming. So next time somebody asks you, you know, what you're breathing, tell them mostly nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen, and a real small amount of argon, and uh, you'll probably blow their minds. Now, what is the greenhouse effect? Well, this is a very simple schematic, and I'm just going to go through this quickly. Uh, you know, we have the sun, which is the main energy source for our atmosphere and our climate system. That energy comes, it makes it to the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, some of it's reflected by the, the Earth and atmosphere system. Some of it's actually absorbed in the atmosphere. Uh, and it says here that most radiation is absorbed, though, by the Earth's surface. That's kind of true. It's about 50% of the radiation that makes it to the top of the Earth's atmosphere actually makes it down to be absorbed at the Earth's surface. Well, what happens is, as you know, if you go out and you lay out in the sun on the beach here in Delaware, what happens is you lay in the sun for an hour, you get pretty warm. Well, the same thing, of course, happens to the Earth's surface. So as it absorbs that incoming solar radiation, it warms up and, at, and it actually emits or gives off infrared radiation. Now, these two are different and they interact differently with the atmosphere. And it turns out that our atmosphere is a good absorber of that infrared radiation that the ground is giving up and trying to send back to outer space. And as it says here, then some of that infrared radiation passes through the atmosphere. Some is absorbed. And as it's absorbed by the atmosphere, anytime you take in energy, your temperature goes up. So the, the atmospheric temperature goes up and it gives off infrared radiation in all directions. Some of this comes back down towards the Earth's surface and it heats up and warms up the Earth's surface in the lower atmosphere. Now, you know, Greenhouse uh, effect has a bad connotation, I think now, but it's really not a bad thing at all. It's a good thing because if there was not this basic greenhouse effect, we wouldn't be living on this planet. It would be too cold for us to be on this planet if it wasn't for what I call the natural greenhouse effect. But here's the problem. Keep in mind that those two gases that I've already mentioned, carbon dioxide and water vapor, are both very good greenhouse gases. They absorb uh, infrared or long wave radiation that tries to leave the surface, and then they re-radiate some of that back down towards the surface, keeping it warmer. And the problem that we're running into now is this is a graph that just shows from 1960 up through the present time. Uh, and this is the uh, atmospheric composition of CO2 at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. That's where they typically measure this because it's out in the middle of really nowhere and is the, very much the natural uh, uh, amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Well, you'll notice it's gone up from about 310 parts per million in 1960 all the way up to about 420 parts per million now. That's a huge increase. And the whole idea is, is if you put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, you should absorb more outgoing uh, infrared radiation and the surface should warm up. And if you say, well, what does that 420 parts per million really mean to us? Is that something that happens all the time? Did we have that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere 50 years ago or 100 years ago? Well, the answer is no. This is a curve that goes back 800,000 years. And there's various ways that we can measure how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere. A lot of it, or, or for at least part of this time period, ice cores, I'm not gonna go into all this, but there's a lot of different ways to measure it. And you'll see that we were below this 300 parts per million until about 1950 for the last 800,000 years. And since 1950, when we reached about 300 parts per million, once again, we've increased now to 420 parts per million. And so that is a big deal. That's a lot more of this greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, that is now in our atmosphere, more than we've seen in the last nearly million years, okay? 
And that's really where this whole issue of global warming comes in. Now, where does these greenhouse gases come from? Well, there's others. There's carbon dioxide, as you'll see up here, methane, nitrous oxide, fluorinated gases. These are all greenhouse gases that uh, we as humans help to put into the atmosphere. Uh, some of these get into the atmosphere naturally as well. But you can see the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is carbon dioxide, making up about 82% of the greenhouse gases that uh, we're putting into the atmosphere. And where do these greenhouse gases come from? Well, they come from transportation, cars, trucks, et cetera. They come from electricity generation. They come from industry, agriculture, commercial uses, uh, and then finally residential use. And so basically, as I say here in this slide, the idea is, is if you have more greenhouse gases, you should have a warmer temperature on the earth. Now, one other thing I haven't mentioned that I'll get to in a moment is water vapor is also going to be pretty important to this story. But just like with everything else in science, the devil is really in the details. And so we have happening in our Earth atmosphere system these feedbacks. And there's literally tens, if not hundreds, of potential feedbacks that go each way. Some of those feedbacks help to speed global warming, uh, increase global warming. Some of them tend to fight against it. And I'm just going to give you two very simple ones here as examples. So basically, this would be for a positive feedback. You put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it causes the planet to warm. As the planet warms, the oceans also warm. As the oceans warm, you get more evaporation from the oceans. And it turns out that that water vapor that goes into the atmosphere is also a very good greenhouse gas. So not only you have CO2 going into the atmosphere and those other gases that I just mentioned, but you also have water vapor going into the atmosphere. That increased water vapor causes the atmosphere to warm even more, which causes more evaporation, which causes more water vapor to be in the atmosphere. And so you get this positive feedback. Okay, and that would enhance global warming. On the other hand, you can have negative feedbacks as well. Now, I want to say at the outset, what I have here is a very complicated feedback. And it's complicated because it depends very much on the type of clouds you get and the height of the clouds. But one way that you could have a negative feedback would be to warm the atmosphere. Uh, as you warm the atmosphere due to carbon dioxide going into it, once again, you get more evaporation. But with more water vapor in the atmosphere, you could have more cloud cover. And depending on the type of cloud cover you get and the height of that cloud cover, that might decrease the incoming amount of solar radiation which limits the amount of energy making to the Earth's surface, which would help to cool the Earth's surface down. And so that would be fighting against global warming. The problem is, is that there's many, many of these feedbacks. And that's what, uh, you know, a lot of the science is about still trying to understand these different feedback mechanisms. So I hope that that gives you a pretty good idea of the, of how global warming works. We know that we're putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We know that as you do that, there's some positive feedback mechanisms that should help to even enhance global warming. There are also some negative feedback mechanisms that might fight against it. But the way that we can really kind of tell which of those are winning, at least for right now, is to look at the data. And so the rest of this talk, I really just want to look at the data first across the globe, then across the United States, uh, and then finally here in Delaware. So let's first look at global temperature. And this is a curve that's pretty amazing, really. This is showing the global uh, temperature going back to 1880. And these are temperature anomalies, which means difference from some average value. That average value is based on the 20th century, 1901 to 2000 time period. And what you see is, we had negative temperature anomalies across the globe, lower than the average based on this time period from about 1880 through almost 1940. We had a little bit of an uptick, then things kind of uh, uh, leveled out again. But then look what's happened since the 1970s, a very dramatic increase in temperatures across the globe. And as you take a look and you do the statistics on this or you do the calculations, 
This is an upward trend in temperature of about 0.137 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. Now, I'm not being, the reason I'm being kind of exact there is you say that to most people and they say, well, who cares about a tenth of a degree Fahrenheit, okay? Uh, well, in this case, it's a little bit more than a tenth, almost 0.15 degrees Fahrenheit. But what you have to remember is this is the trend per decade. And we've had 14 decades since 1880. And if you do the simple math, that means we've seen an increase of between two and three degrees Fahrenheit in our mean global temperature since 1880. And in fact, when you take a look up here, uh, it's probably closer to three degrees Fahrenheit because at two degrees Fahrenheit is along this red trend line. Uh, you can see that the last decade or so has been very warm. So, you know, this is not insignificant. This is a big change in temperature over a relatively short time period uh, when you're looking especially at a mean across the entire globe. And it's not just one data set that shows this. I just wanted to show here are several different groups and I won't go into who they are that calculate uh, global temperatures. And if you look at all these curves, all these different cover or colors, they start at different times. But you can see they go up and down together very well and uh, are quite close to one another. And so this is not just one research group or something that's indicating that the globe is warming up. These are surface temperatures from really the top research groups across the world that all agree that uh, our global temperatures are certainly warming over the last 140 years. Now this is just, this is only gonna take 30 seconds. So let me explain what you're gonna look at. This is just a little video starting back for the five year period, 1884 to 1888, okay? And wherever you see the blue colors on this global map, we have temperatures below that 1951 to 1980 this time mean value. This is how NASA did it. They looked at, okay, what are temperatures like compared to the 1951 to 1980 mean? So if it's blue, they're below that mean. If it's red, that means the temperatures are above that the mean of that time period. And these are for five year periods called pentads, but you can watch the years go up down here, but watch the colors change, especially in the Northern hemisphere. So you can see we're starting out now, we're going up through the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, things are mostly blue and maybe yellow. You're starting to see a little red here and there, but look what happens here once we get to about 1970 or 1980. About 1980, you start to see red, 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 and pretty much the entire globe colored by red. And again, that's about a two degree Celsius where you see these very dark red colors or two degrees Celsius or nearly four degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature compared to what the temperature was across the globe in 1951 through 1980. Okay, and you know, there's only a few places on this entire global map here where you see temperatures below normal and especially high temperatures uh, up here in the Arctic regions of the Northern Hemisphere. Now, if you just look at the last 30 years, uh, I know this looks a lot like the map that I just showed you, but I just wanted to show you this, how much things have gone up. This is just showing temperature trends over the last 30 years. The red colors, again, are positive temperature trends. The blue colors are negative. Uh, once again, if you look at the Northern Hemisphere, there's many places across the Northern Hemisphere in the Arctic, here in Eastern Europe, where we've seen about a degree uh, Fahrenheit per decade increase in temperature. That means the temperatures there have increased by about three degrees Fahrenheit over the course of just that 30 year period. And so certainly the data is showing us that, you know, the globe is warming. We can also look at precipitation, which is a little bit harder to look at. And so we're not gonna spend much time on it, but I just wanted to show you, this is the worldwide precipitation from 1900 or 1901 through 2019. And where you see green are years where we had more precipitation across the globe than normal, brown are years where we had uh, negative precipitation anomalies or less precipitation than normal. And all I wanna do is just point to the fact that, again, once we get out here to this later period, we're seeing more precipitation generally most years across the globe than we're seeing uh, unusually dry years. 
And here is just showing you the precipitation trends, very much like the temperature trend map that I showed you a little bit ago, where you see the green are positive trends in precipitation. And you can see you get a lot of those across the northern part of the northern hemisphere, where you see brown or negative trends in precipitation, a lot of that across Africa and uh, parts of Asia here, also some parts of South America. Uh, but it's not nearly as consistent as the temperature trends are. So that's something to remember, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes, is that uh, here in Delaware, we see kind of the same thing. We see a very definite signal. I guess this is a spoiler alert. I shouldn't be saying this yet, but a very definite signal of temperature, uh, a little bit less consistent signal of precipitation. But that hopefully gives you an idea of what's happening across the globe. And now what I want to do is come down to just the United States. And I know this is just the uh, continental United States. I apologize to Hawaii and Alaska, but a lot of the maps didn't have that on it. And so I'm um, talking primarily here about the continental US. And first, I just want to look at temperature across the continental US. And this just shows you the mean annual temperature. And of course, it's warmer down here. The mean annual temperature in Florida and South Texas is 70 to 80. By the time you get up here in northern Maine, northern Minnesota, northern North Dakota, the mean annual temperature is more like 30 to 40. So, you know, we have a pretty big range in our mean annual temperature uh, as you go from south to north. So that gives you a little bit of just the background. But what I really want to show you are the changes that have been taking place. And so here we have the entire U.S. national mean annual temperature. Uh, we have good data starting back in 1895, and you see a curve that looks very much like the global curve does, with an increase in temperatures uh, a little bit through the 1940s from about 1895 through 1940, leveling off again until about 1980, and then a very definite increase in U.S. temperatures after 1980. Once again, this trend doesn't sound all that impressive when you look at it by decade. It's about 0.15 degrees Fahrenheit per decade, but that's about a two degree Fahrenheit increase since 1895 here in the US. And this is already having effects on things like growing season length, where you can and can't plant certain plants anymore, et cetera. So uh, again, you know, two degrees doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're looking at an area across as, as large as the United States, that's a, a pretty big increase in temperature again over just the last century or so. And here's where those temperature changes have occurred. This is just showing you the average temperature trends across the US where you see the red, it's getting warmer, where you see the blue, it's getting colder. Notice there's almost nowhere in this map where you see blue, or at least I'm not seeing any blue. There are some areas here in the Southeast United States and the Mississippi Valley where there hasn't been much change. But the two big locations where we've seen some really pretty significant increases in temperature, and by the way, this is in degrees Fahrenheit per decade. So again, even though these are small numbers, if you add them up over you know, 120 year period, they really add up quickly. The Western US is certainly, we've seen uh, grow warmer over time and the Northeast US. And uh, so just keep that in mind as we then talk about Delaware here in a, a couple minutes. We then had the U.S. precipitation. So what has hap been happening with precipitation? Well, U.S. precipitation is kind of the, the story of two countries in some ways. Uh, right here, right around in this area is the 100th meridian. And uh, if you go east of there, we have a fairly wet climate, a humid climate across most of the U.S. You can see here, southeastern part of the United States, 50 to 70 inches of precipitation a year. Up here where we are in Delaware, 40 to 50, and that's exactly right. We average about 45. But then look out here in the western United States, except for the coastal areas, Washington, Oregon, and northern California, much, much drier conditions, anywhere between about five and 10 uh, inches of precipitation a year in the desert southwest and much of the rest of the western United States. But again, we want to look at the changes. So what's been happening to the U.S. precipitation? Well, it's been increasing, but not at a huge rate. Uh, it's been increasing at about point, almost 0 0.2 inches per decade. And if you do the simple math, that means that we've gone up by about 2.2 inches across the United States since 1895. 
The other thing I just want to point out to you about the United States, and we'll see the same thing in Delaware, is the huge variability, though, you can get in precipitation from one year to another. Uh, we had this time period back in the early 1970s where we had about 35 inches of rain averaged across the U.S. Back here about 1910, we had more like about 25. So there can be huge variations uh, year to year in the amount of precipitation that falls. And where has that increase been taking place? Well, almost exclusively in the eastern part of the United States. Western part of the United States out here, we really haven't seen much change in precipitation, but the eastern part of the United States is where we've seen increases uh, in the precipitation. Uh, again, with just a few parts of the southeast here not seeing much of any change, but very little drying, although there is some drying down here in the uh, desert southwest, they already get so little precipitation that, you know, it doesn't, they, they can't get a big drying because there's already so little precipitation that's occurring out there. So that gives you an idea, I hope, of what's been happening in the U.S. Increasing temperatures uh, in general throughout, throughout most of the U.S. and increasing precipitation, at least here in the eastern part of the country. But what I want to finish up with tonight and really spend most of my time on is Delaware's climate. And we live in a small state and a lot of times people say to me as a state climatologist, how much variation can there be, you know, and, and I always say to them a lot more than you would think. We don't have a huge variation in temperature, but we can in some years have a 20 inch difference in precipitation from one part of the state to the other. So we do get a lot of variation. And I always tell people that Delaware's climate system is really pretty complicated. Now, I hope everybody knows right here's Delaware. And we have some interesting things that are going on around us. And the main thing is all these water bodies that are around us. And remember that water bodies cool down and heat up much more slowly than the land surface. So right now, uh, in general, if you go to the beaches and you go out very far from the shoreline, you're going to find that the water temperatures are quite a bit colder than our normal daytime temperatures, atmospheric temperatures. Of course, in the winter, it's the other way around. We might be below zero on land, but the, the water temperatures off the coast are still going to be in the 40s or something like that. So the thing to remember is that water bodies cool down very slowly, heat up very slowly compared to the land surface. Well, that's important for us because we have this huge continent to our west. We have a huge land surface to our west. We have the Atlantic Ocean out to the east. And on top of that here on the Delmarva, we have the Delaware Bay on one side of us and the Chesapeake Bay on the other side. And those two heat up and cool down at different rates. But remember that our weather is coming from the west towards the east. And so we end up with a very, uh, uh, a kind of modified continental, con continental climate, which I'll show you in a moment. But something else is here that we haven't talked about yet. It's not like this ocean out here is all the same temperature. This is actually a sea surface temperature map from June 1st. And uh, I just want to point out to you how convoluted or complicated sea surface temperatures are near us. If you take a look up here just off the New Jersey coast, uh, back on June 1st, just a few days, a couple days ago, the sea surface temperatures were about 53 degrees. If you come down here to just off the North Carolina coast in the Gulf Stream, they're about 80 degrees. That's almost a 30 degree difference in what those sea surface temperatures are. And then look at the difference in temperatures, although not huge, are between the Delaware Bay and parts of the Chesapeake Bay. So these temperature changes you get right off the coast here in Delaware also complicate our weather and climate. But this is what our uh, annual temperature cycle looks like. The red are the highest monthly values we've ever had for temperature. The blue, the lowest, and the gray are the average values uh, calculated over this long 1895 to 2020 time period. And we do live in a continental climate, meaning it's warm in the summer, it's colder in the winter. Duh, I guess a lot of people would say to me about that, but that's not the case everywhere across the globe or even the United States. And we also have more variability in our monthly temperatures uh, during the winter months than we do during the summer months. So that's what temperature looks like for us throughout the year. 
But precipitation, I find really fascinating. The green here are the highest monthly values we've ever had for Delaware average precipitation. The brown are the lowest monthly values we've ever had. And the blue color there is the mean value. We average about 45 inches of precipitation a year. But look at a month like September. We've had as little as approximately half an inch of precip on average fall across Delaware in one September between 1895 and 2020. Another September more like about 11 inches. So the point here is, is that our precipitation here in Delaware is wildly uh, variable, uh, just depends on the year. And certainly any of you are there in agriculture or horticulture or anything where water is a very important part of what you do, realize that that's the case. Now, what's the statewide mean annual temperature look like for us over that 1895 to 2020 period? It's increasing rather quickly with a trend of about a quarter of a degree Fahrenheit per decade. And that means that since 1895 here in Delaware, we've seen an increase in our mean annual temperatures of about three degrees Fahrenheit. Now, again, there's a lot of variability up and down. It depends on the year, but in general, if you follow this trend line, we've seen an increase of about three degrees Fahrenheit. And what I'm gonna show you next are just the individual seasons because I often get asked, okay, well, is there a particular season that you see an increase in temperature and not another season? Well, let me just show you that and I'll go, I'm gonna go through these quickly, but here is our mean winter temperature and you can see it's got an upward trend, a significant upward trend of about 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. If we take a look at spring, we also see an upward trend there. Uh, this is going to get boring because they all look the same, folks. Uh, summer, an, an upward trend again in our summer temperatures and in our fall temperatures, also an upward trend. So temperature, when it comes to temperature across Delaware, uh, all the seasons are increasing. And if I had more time, I would show you the maximum temperatures compared to the minimums. We don't have time for that tonight, but there's, there's also, we're seeing both of those increase. So that kind of tells the story of temperature in Delaware. We're seeing upward trends in temperature all seasons of the year. What about precipitation? Well, precipitation is a little different, although we are seeing an upward trend in precipitation. But once again, I just want to point out to you the variability that you see here. Uh, first off, I should say the upward trend in precipitation for Delaware gives us about a 3.6 inch increase since 1895. So in general, we're getting wetter here in Delaware, but there's also this huge variability, say between this year right here when we had 60 inches of precipitation and, and out here towards the end of our record, and back here in 1930 when we had less than 30 inches. That's a 30 inch difference across Delaware in a year. That creates big problems for agriculture and, and other folks that depend on precipitation. And then I'm just going to show you these maps again quickly. I don't want to bore you, but uh, precipitation is kind of interesting because in the winter, there isn't any real trend. It's extremely small. It's negative as if anything, but there's essentially no trend in winter precipitation. You get to the spring, again, a very small upward trend. You get to the summer, and again, a very small downward trend. So you're saying, where does all this trend come from? Well, we're down to one season left, and that's autumn. And where we've been seeing a trend is in autumn precipitation. And for the longest time, it was thought that this autumn precipitation was trending upward because of tropical systems. That's when we typically get hit by hurricanes and tropical storms in the autumn, early autumn or late summer into early autumn. But really, we've gone back and looked at it, and it doesn't quite match up. It looks like our systems whether they're tropical or mid-latitude type systems, weather systems here are just in general getting wetter during the autumn time of the year here in Delaware. So uh, also people always ask about snowfall and I love snowfall. So uh, I had to throw this in. This is just for Wilmington. We have our best data on snowfall for Wilmington that goes back to 1948. There are no long-term trends, but again, I'm easily amused by things, I guess, but this is just amazing to me. Uh, some of you will remember back in 2009, 2010, we had uh, over 70 inches of snow 
six feet of snow fall in northern Delaware. Uh, and just last year, and you can see back there in the 1990s, we had essentially nothing more than a, a few traces that added up to about half an inch. So talk about a place where you probably don't want to start a ski resort, uh, but has huge snowfall variability, that would be us. So if you summarize everything for our region, climate change in our region, temperatures increasing annually and all through every season, precipitation's a little more spotty. It's increasing annually, it's increasing during the autumn and just slightly during spring, but it's actually, this N stands for negative. It's actually, uh, a slightly negative trend during the winter and also the summer. So not as apparent as the temperature changes. And so finally, I wanna finish up tonight by answering the question of what might lie in the future for us? What do the models tell us about the future? And what are some of the other impacts of climate change in Delaware? And I try, I'm trying to show at least two of these and also give a shout out to the folks at DENREC for a really good report that they did several years ago looking at climate change uh, uh, here in Delaware. But the two things I just want to bring your attention to are coastal flooding issues and also agriculture, because those are both very, very important and uh, big deals when it comes to the climate here in Delaware. And I'm not going to go into these in any great depth at all, but I just want to say that sea level in Lewis, Delaware, we have good records going back, even some as far back as 1920. And to make a long story short, we've seen a sea level rise of about 14 to 16 inches, a relative sea level rise with the oceans coming up and Delaware sinking a little bit. Uh, we've seen a, uh, you know, 14 to 16 inches since 1920. And that's of course, you know, really important if you, if you live along the coast, it's also important when we get strong coastal storms, coastal flooding, nuisance flooding is on the increase. Those are all again, big deals for Delaware. When you take a look at all the models, I served on the Delaware Sea Level Rise Committee uh, that was chaired by John Callahan from uh, the Delaware Geologic Survey. And basically the committee went back and looked at all the most up-to-date modeling, all the most up-to-date information for our part of uh, North America and came up with three possible sea level rise uh, uh, scenarios, a low and intermediate and high. And so we're right here at 2020 now, even the lowest scenario takes us up to about uh, nearly half a meter of sea level rise increase by 2100. So that would be another 18 inches or so on top of the sea level rise that's already taken place. But if you look at the high scenario there, it would be just dramatic, uh, one and a half meter sea level rise if that would take place. And you know, there's some of the models that predict that and there's some people, uh, people that study this that think that that's very possible. Uh, that would be catastrophic for Delaware. So certainly sea level rise is another aspect of climate change that we need to be worried about. And then finally, what do the models tell us about temperature and precipitation, which really impacts agriculture and so many other things that we do? Well, the models are telling us here, the red line is kind of the worst case scenario. The blue line is a best case scenario. We're right about here right now. And uh, you can see that both of these lines go up. So the models, and this is the CMIP models are taking a lot of models, putting them all together and kind of getting an average out of them. They're all showing increases for us. This is particularly for Georgetown Sussex County Airport. And uh, so no matter how you look at it, whether it's best case or it's worst case, our temperatures look to, according to the models to continue to rise. Precipitation though is a little bit more iffy. Uh, it doesn't show any real long-term huge increases in precipitation, but one of the things the models do show is an increase in, in precipitation intensity. And we just had last year, a few days after Hurricane Isaias that came through on beginning of August, a five minute, a new five minute thousand year precipitation event for Delaware. Uh, where in less than an hour, we had nearly four inches of rain at one of our stations and uh, just incredible precipitation intensity. So what do the computer models really tell us? Well, 
as far as the future is concerned? Well, they tell us the temperatures across our region look to increase in the coming decades. Uh, there's really no models that I'm aware of right now that, that show anything different than that. They show that precipitation amounts will not change dramatically when you look at average kind of annual precipitation, but uh, the high intensity precipitation events might increase. And that sea level rise along the mid-Atlantic coast is also going to continue to uh, to, con to continue to happen, and that you know hopefully we will not see those higher two scenarios, but it could rise dramatically. And the best way to tell with me how computer models are working is compare them to how they're doing over the past several decades. And it's interesting that the observations over the last several decades really support these model projections. We've seen increases in temperature. We've seen increases in sea level. We've seen really only minor changes in precipitation, but we have, especially over the last 10 or 15 years, started to see an increase in precipitation intensity. So that gives us some confidence that the models have been right over the last several decades maybe you know they're right moving forward. So that is where I think I will end things. I'll be happy to take any questions or, or uh, comments. And uh, I don't know, Tracy, do you want me to stop sharing my screen or just leave that up there so I can go back if there's any questions about a particular slide or anything? Yeah, I think you may wanna just keep that up there so that you can go back and refer to it. So I think that's just perfect. Um, so we have a, a number of questions that were put into um, the Q&A. And so I think we'll go back to the, to the beginning. Um, Sam Hellings has two questions um, okay. for you. And um, the first one is, what is the magnitude of the role of vegetation in particular, in particular aquatic vegetation and absorbing CO2 and removing it from the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. And how can we quantify that on a global scale? Well, I am going to, th this is one where being a meteorologist and climatologist, I, I'm, I'm not an oceanographer and I didn't even stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So I won't try to answer that question. Uh, I do know that that, that is a, certainly an important component, but I would be uh, you know, remiss if I tried to answer that because it's something that I've never done any research into and uh, except to know that it is certainly important and people are talking about that all the time, but it's outside my area of expertise. So sorry about that, but hopefully so, not all the questions will be outside. I'm sure not. Sam has a, 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 another question in terms of are there methods to accurately estimate temperatures from years, decades, centuries, and millennia past down to the temporal resolution of like X degrees per decade ballpark that you showed when you showed the graph of the last half century? Yes, uh, I, we can certainly go back in the instrumental record, which we have fairly good data back again into the late 1800s. So we can certainly go back into the 1800s. We can go past that with tree rings and get at least annual type resolution uh, with, t with, with tree rings. And of course, if you know anything about tree rings, you know that uh, depends where you are, the type of tree, it depends on the type of climate system you're in, but they can also supply a lot of information uh, on an annual basis. You can then start to take a look at ice cores which in some cases can give you kind of an annual signal and then they start to give you know longer term signals and then i won't go back past that but that would take you back several hundred years at least where you can get a pretty good idea of what the overall climate was like uh, from those methodologies he has a, a question embedded with that dan in terms of if we kind of look at our last half century um, mm -hmm. and thinking about the, the temperature changes um, that we've had. Have there been other half centuries in the past that are like our lifetime? Not, not in the instrumental record. And, uh, you know, you can go back and look and find, you know, you can kind of chop up the, the record that we have in many different ways and try to find times that, uh, you know, you, you see big increases. And we have seen big increases in the past. But those were not associated, as we saw in one of the first slides, with those big changes in uh, carbon dioxide concentration. And from most of the literature that I've read, this is likely over the, the last 50 years or so, 
uh, one of, if not the largest increase in temperature we've seen uh, that we know of. Now, you know, I am not a paleoclimatologist either. I'm more of a meteorologist climatologist. So I would not want to say that you can't go back sometime in very ancient history, millions of years ago, but then you wouldn't have the resolution to see a 50 year period anyhow. So as far as we know right now, this 50 year time period has been, uh, you know, we've seen one of the, if not the biggest increase that we've ever seen. So um, Karen, um Carlson asks, if we're looking further back, and I just lost my question a second. Um, okay, <laughs> it just jumped on the screen for me. So looking further back, um, how does the current climate trend, if we're thinking about 1880 up to the present, compare with periods like the 9th and 13th century um, prior to the Little Ice Age? Yep, so that was uh, the... Uh the medieval warm period. And we were, uh, you know, we were quite warm then. Uh, it compares favorably, although I, I from, uh, again, my knowledge of it, uh, it is not as warm as we are now, although that depends upon where you were across the globe and so on. So we certainly were warm then, but again, we did not see the dramatic change that we're seeing now, the, the intensity of the change and we are, we're also not looking at carbon dioxide levels going up like they are now. But that's a very good point. I mean, you can go back and find in, in the record, especially the medieval warm period when it was quite warm across a good part of the globe, that was followed by the Little Ice Age, as the questioner said. And then we've been increasing in temperature coming out of the Little Ice Age. But it's really been that time period since the 1960s, which has been really dramatic for for the globe and for us here in Delaware. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, we could really kind of see that with the graphs that you showed. So Ray um, Graf has a couple questions. One is, I didn't answer this because I, I thought you could talk about it in terms of something you did or, or I'm thinking about a student, um, in terms of tracking wind, wind events. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, we have looked at wind events and it depends whether you're talking about convective winds, which go with thunderstorms, or you're just talking about regular wind events. Uh, let me just preface things by saying that wind is one of the most difficult sets of data to get. It is not measured at many places. And uh, there's a lot of problems with wind measurements. And I won't go into all those depending, you know, different people calculate gusts uh, different ways or even average wind speeds. We have not really seen any increase in high wind events here across Delaware when we're looking at convective winds. Uh, we had a master's student look at uh, winds from thunderstorms. Uh, we have seen an increase in the number of reports, but that's because the reporting system has really gotten better. Not so much we don't think that we've actually had more high winds. So um, Ray also mentions, he says, the wind readings at the Lewis campus weather station um, always seem lower than they should. Uh, it, and it, it depends which of the stations because it depends, this is the problem with wind measurements. It depends at what level of the atmosphere you're measuring the winds. The winds increase quite rapidly with height. And so our Delaware Environmental Observing Stations measure the wind speed at about three meters in the atmosphere at about 10 feet. Other folks uh, will measure the National Weather Service measures at 10 meters, which is about 30 feet. And there, there are also some anemometers, which are wind measurement devices on towers that are 60 and 70 feet above the Earth's surface. And again, because of the frictional effects of the Earth's surface, uh, you know, the, the change in wind speeds as you go up can be extremely rapid. So that is probably why you might be looking at one of our stations that is measuring at 10 feet and comparing that to a station that's measuring much higher than that. So Dan, can he, um, Ray also mention if anyone's tracking the dew point temperatures? And I know I yeah. put in an answer to him of where the DO station was. And Ray, mm -hmm. I'll get back to you because you ask about historical data. I'll find the link on the DO station in a second and put that in. But Dan, if you want to say anything mm -hmm. about if you've done um, some work in terms of tracking dew point temperatures. He made a comment about how bad they were um, <laughs> yeah. in stretches of last summer. 
<laughs> yeah, they, they were. And, you know, that's a very good question. And more and more people are starting to look at this. And there's been, and, and we have not done this yet for Delaware. It's something that we've been trying to get a master's student interested in going back and really trying to take a look as far back as we can. Again, the problem with that in Delaware is before the Delaware Environmental Observing System is really a lack of data. Uh, but there are people looking at that and depending upon where they've looked at it uh, across the US and across the world, some places they found increases, some places they found decreases. My gut feeling here is that if we look back over the last 10 or 15 years, with our stations, which we hope to do soon, that we're going to see a bit of an increase in the dew point because we saw some dew point temperatures last year that were just remarkable. They were in the mid to upper 80s uh, a couple of times, which is just horrible. I mean, that's almost unbelievable. When you get a dew point above 80, it's it, it's incredible. And we had some 84, 85 last year. So. Uh, but no, that's a great idea. And if you know a master's student who would like to look at that, please let us know because we'd love to have somebody really dig into that deeply. So um, another question, Christina Schuler asks, if there is a 1.2 meter increase in sea level, then is there a 1.2 meter seawater inundation or is it even greater than the 1.2 meters? Well, that 1.2 meters uh, would be, uh, when you say, is there an inundation of 1.2 meters? It, it would, well, let's put it this way. It would completely change, you know, kind of the coast of Delaware. I mean, that would be, so 1.2 or 1.5 meters is, you know, you're talking 40, 50 inches. You're talking feet of sea level rise there. And certainly that would cause inundation of a lot of the places now that aren't inundated, but even worse, you know, if you would add that to storms that cause coastal flooding to begin with, and then uh, nuisance flooding events, you know, just with high tides uh, during the, the, the uh, tidal cycle, the lunar cycle, uh, it, it would be really catastrophic. So uh, we're hoping that those higher scenarios do not come to pass. Those are associated with massive melting of green, of part of the Greenland ice sheet and parts of Antarctica. But uh, again, some of the research points to those as possibilities. So great, Dan, thanks. Um, Kurt Phillips says, do you have any preferred climate change adaptation landscape options to address increasing precip intensity, more local flash flood stormwater management? Yeah, uh, I don't, but please do look at Sea Grant. Uh, Delaware Sea Grant has done work on that. Uh, they actually have kind of a garden down at the Lewis campus. And uh, I think that there and also some folks in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources here at UD have looked at uh, how those types of structures can be built. And uh, I don't have information on that, but check out Sea Grant. I think that if you look around on their website, you'll find some information on that. So Ray Graff has another question. He said, I noticed in the precip chart, the um, three rapid minimum in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at the Dust Bowl, it, it's funny. We just had, a, I just taught a, a class on that. And I'll see if I can find that here really quickly. All right, were you talk? I don't know if he was talking about Delaware or the U.S. Uh, let me see here. Here's the U.S. national mean precipitation. You can see all of these right down here in the 1930s, uh, very low years. That was the Dust Bowl. But even if you go here to uh, the Delaware precipitation, uh, it doesn't show up uh, nearly as much. In fact, here in Delaware, you can see, because we were so far from it, that some of the 30s, we actually had uh, not, not great, but, but pretty much normal or even above normal precipitation. Uh, but the Dust Bowl really did affect us here in Delaware. Uh, there's some interesting accounts as you go back and read through historical documents here in Delaware of dust actually accumulating uh, across Delaware and the entire mid-Atlantic as some of the dust storms moved through the Great Plains, picked up all that dust and moved it east here. But the Dust Bowl did affect more than just the Great Plains. 
for us here in Delaware, it wasn't anything too dramatic. This was 1930, really before the Dust Bowl got going. And then, as you can see after that, the precip values were kind of near normal. But uh, still an amazing time in American history. So let's do one more question. Mike Rollins says, what are your thoughts on the potential role of the snow albedo feedback in winter warming across Delaware? Um, that's a good question, Mike. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's terribly important in Delaware. And this is just the kind of a, a knee jerk uh, answer to your question. But because we typically don't have a lot of snow and our number of days with snow on the ground, are typically not many here in Delaware. I don't think it affects us much here in Delaware. Now, certainly when we have a, a lot of days where we have snow cover, we tend to be colder, uh, you know, and so snow, that's what I do most of my research on, plays a huge role in modulating local temperatures. But here in Delaware, in, in the scheme of things, because we have so few snow cover days, and uh, because it's so variable, I doubt that it plays a really big role in our overall long-term uh, winter temperature trends. Um, so two others, and then I think we'll, we may um, call it a night, but Nancy Target was on. She said, really enjoyed oh. your, your lecture, um, Dan. So that's just really kind of cool um, yeah. to, to hear from, from Nancy. Nancy. And yeah. then you have a student, Marissa um, Buchaman, and I don't remember the last name. Um, yeah. She says it's a great I, lecture. I, yeah, I, I do. I, I do remember. So thanks. She said she thanks. had classes with you in, yeah. from 1998 to 2000. I was, I was going to say from the late 90s. Yep. Yep. So, well, thank you. Thanks to Nancy and to, to, to you. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I think we'll take one more. And then um, I think we'll do a couple closing things. So I'll do one more um, that um, Sophia Schmidt um, stuck in here real quick. She said, what are the best resources for learning about greenhouse gas emissions in Delaware? Do we know the current uh, greenhouse yes. gas contributions from different municipalities and zip codes, industries and specific types of operations? Yeah, I can't tell you how uh, far down you can get with that, but the people that you would want to contact there, and I'm not trying to pass the buck at all, but uh, you would want to talk to the, the people in the DENREC I, I forget, they just changed the name of their section. I think it's Coastal Energy, and, and but it's Denrec Energy. Uh, they, if, if you just kind of Google that, I think that you'll come up with that section of Denrec, and they do a lot of work on that. They keep track of greenhouse gas emissions. They, they have that information. That's something that, that we don't have in our office, but that would be the place to look for it. And even John Callahan put a put the Delaware climate plan in the chat. So thanks, mm -hmm. John, that you're you're helping us out with that. So I think with that, I just want to say a couple concluding remarks. Um, thank you, Dan, for this um, very interesting and comprehensive of look at kind of climate change, climate and climate change across the globe down to Delaware, because it's really kind of neat to see what's happening in our back door. We had, I think, upwards of 125 participants, which is really cool. Um, I just want to also note to all of you, and I'm trying to find my email real quick, that the next lecture, the second one, is Thursday, January, or January, June 17th. Mm -hmm. It's on community resilience and coastal flooding. So with that, I'll thank Dan again and all the participants for joining us and for all your questions. It was a very interesting lecture, and thank you, and good night. Yep. Thanks, everybody.